Hello! Good afternoon everyone and welcome po to the 13th episode or the 13th webinar po for our University of the Philippines and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation's Stop COVID Deaths webinar series wherein we talk about the clinical management updates of COVID-19 cases. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento. As you know, uh, we have a very special guest po ngayon and the topic po is very, very timely as you have seen in our posters. And with me, as always, is Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado, who is the special envoy of uh, the President for Global Health Initiatives. Dr. Susie? Hi, Raymond, and uh, hello, everyone. Good day. We hope you're all uh, healthy, feeling okay. And Raymond, it looks like you are somewhere interesting. Where are you right now? I'm I'm actually in the inside the car, ma'am. I'm parked because uh, we have been experiencing some uh, uh, well a major power outage here in Central Luzon. Po, uh, we have not had any power for the last uh, sixteen hours. So in <laughs> po. Wow. So you're probably charging your phone in the car. Am I correct? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, we, the show goes on, right, Raymond? So anyway, magandang araw po sa inyo lahat. Um, we're glad you're here. Um, as Raymond said, we've got a very, very interesting uh, topic. I'd like to welcome everyone who's watching inside the webinar. And we have a lot of people in the webinar. I'm just going to talk about that in a bit. And for those of you who are watching on YouTube and those of you who are joining on the playback, thank you for joining us. This effort uh, would not be possible with your participation and your support. Raymond. Thank you, Dr. Susie. So as always, Paul, we would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who is part of this uh, production team. It starts at the top at the University of the Philippines system, uh, led and represented Paul, by the Office of the President and Office of the Executive Vice President, Dr. Chodoro Herbosa, uh, the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs, Dr. Elena Pernia, and represented also herein by Assistant Vice President Rika Abad and also Director Timi Cabana of MPRO. We also have the tech team of uh, UP System helping us out, uh, led by Director Paulo Paje and also helping out uh, Noel Feria and uh, Gabo Villorente. And also over at the UP Manila side, well, we cannot thank uh, enough uh, Chancellor Carmen Cita Padilla, uh, NIH Executive Director Eva Cochonco de la Paz and also a uh, PGH Director Gap Legaspi and UP College of Medicine Dean Charlotte Chong. So maraming salamat po uh, sa UP Manila side. And also, let us not forget our partner po uh, in, in this endeavor. And this is our 13th episode na po, our 13th webinar, uh, the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation uh, led by uh, President and CEO Brigadier General Ricardo Morales po. Uh, Dr. Susie, shall we go ahead with our uh, pre-test questions or Raymond, announce what do you mo, think? Announce mo na certificates before people start asking. Ah, yes. Opo, opo. So we continue to have all of these questions po no, regarding the certificates. And we, are, we have been constantly reminding everyone that certificates... Uh, lagi nyo pong tatandaan, lagi nyo pong babantayan din po how you enter or input your name. Kasi po, uh, a lot of uh, the questions po have been revolving around the uh, please edit my name. Uh, so, whatever, um, let's say, name po that you input into the um, the registration page, yun na po yung mag appear sa certificates. And certificates, along with the link to the slide presentation of our resource person, well, will be shared po via email to only the attendees po who have spent at least 50% of the webinar duration. So yun po yung ating, um, let's say, criteria po for receiving the certificates and also the link to the slides. Thank you, okay. Dr. Susie, for that. Yeah. Thanks, Raymond. Um, I just want to acknowledge, no, kasi uh, it's very interesting since we started this webinar series through the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation that's been inviting everyone to attend the webinars as well. So today we have people from Surigao del Norte. We have people watching from uh, Dalubhasaan and Lunsod ng San Pablo. Um, okay, and uh, infection prevention and control in Hospital ng Imos. Uh, okay, and then we have People who are watching from 
Oh goodness. Okay. So so many other places, Laguna, Davao, Cebu, UP Los Baños, watching from Kansas. I suppose that's not in Cubao, right? That's Kansas in the United States. St. Luke's Medical Center, Palompon, Leyte, uh, Rapu-Rapu District Hospital. Napakarami po, no? The Sultanate of Oman, Batangas Medical Center. Okay, humahapol pa yung iba. Kalinga. All right. Negros Occidental. Gosh, right? So we have so many people. Very interesting topic. But before we go into the topic, we always have an introductory speaker who sort of, you know, gives us a bigger context for our webinar. And it is, uh, I am deeply honored to, to introduce our, um, our special guest for today. Actually, we have two special guests, but this one first. Okay. So indeed, when you look at production of a webinar, um, you know, you can turn on a camera and just do it. But I think what we've tried to do in this series is to bring together people who have expertise in many different disciplines. And it was a special, a very special, uh, what should I say, strategic um, addition to the team to have somebody who's well known in the, in the field of film and television production. And that has made our life so easier for Raymond and I uh, she's kind of strict, right? So, so, but that's good because we've got a real production uh, behind this webinar series and truly it takes a village to make a webinar. So without further ado, may I introduce the Executive Director of TVUP and Professor Emeritus of the University of the Philippines in Film. Uh, and she's also with the College of Mass Communication. Um, Dr. Grace Javier Alonso, who we call Direct Gigi, Mom Gigi. Mom, welcome. Uh, not welcome. Welcome. Hello. Cam. <laughs> welcome. Oh, also, I'm, not on cam. I'm always behind the camera. But this, this is a special day, special day for me, really, to be able to uh, greet everyone on cam. Right. So, uh, Mom, oh. ano, um, what do, you think, what do you think of our webinar series? I mean, you've directed so many you things. Right. I was looking at your participants natin. Uh -oh. Talagang lumulobo na. Hindi na makapasok. 500 plus. Uh, I don't know. We cannot accommodate anymore within the webinar. However, thousands are watching in our web streaming sa TVUP. So this is a blockbuster today. And... Uh, well, we're very excited about it. Oh, uh oh, ma'am. So, ano, ano message nyo sa mga nakikinig uh, sa akin? Yes. Uh oh, magano message ako ha? Di Wala ma naman ako slides. Wala ako slides. So let me, let me uh, look into my. Ah, uh, ito. Meron ako notes dito eh. Oh, uh, ah, uh, Doctor Susie, Doctor Raymond. Good afternoon sa inyo. At ganun din si Dr. Cynthia Saloma, nandiyan na, si Dr. Kuchonko de La Paz. And I'd like to take this opportunity talaga to tell our participants in this webinar, at saka yung thousands watching in the web streaming of TVUP, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, we, you know, we have broadcast what? Uh, we're on our 13th episode, and dami na. So we have broadcasted nationally and internationally. Libo-libo po ang nag access napakadami. Every Friday, so wag natin kakalimutan, every fr Friday, we should be all together, magkakasama tayo. And if you want a replay, just log on TVUP. Naka-archive po yan dyan. So, at maraming marami na po tayong suki. To our consistent followers and our first-timers to join our webinar, we are actually building a community of learners and teachers here. And you know that uh, you, you really can actively participate. Always take this opportunity to ask questions. And your, your well-known uh, medical and public health experts, practitioners, researchers, and hospital administrators can answer them based on well-researched data information 
with their added insights and with your questions and your views, please come in with them. And the synergy comes in and brings about new knowledge. This is that, that you can use in your decision making in your field. So everyone can participate in this concept of connectivism. It's a, a look it up, it's a learning theory applied in this digital age. You have this platform, your expert right in front of you, first-hand information. So maximize this opportunity. And uh, that is the idea in knowing what is happening in hospital management and beyond in fighting this COVID-19 pandemic. There are many unknowns that we would want to understand and to make sense and meanings of this phenomenon. Like today, we're fortunate. We have uh, Dr. Cynthia Saloma uh, with us. She's uh, the executive director of Philippine Genome Center, highly cited international scholar, a molecular biology principal investigator in many genomic projects. So maganda pag-usapan dito ngayon sa bahay magla-lecture siya uh, and give us all the data here and uh, yung mga genetic sequencing. So it's, uh, it's time to put your uh, questions together. But on top of that, nandito pa rin si Dr. Eva Kuchonko de La Paz, the Executive Director of the National Institutes of uh, Health and the Vice President for Research of UP Manila. Hindi ba rare occasion yan? Nandito na sila, they are here together. Put all our questions together. You know, I'm more than really glad that TVUP is part of this webinar series. And uh, I have to talk to, uh, I'd like to talk about TVUP. It is the University of the Philippines Internet Television under the office of UP President Danilo Concepcion and EVP Ted Arbosa working very closely with VPPA uh, Nanny Pernia and the hardworking AVP Rika Bat, ITTC Director Pauli Pahe, and our powerhouse hosts, kilalang kilala nyo sila, internationally renowned Dr. Susie Mercado, of course, and the power behind the National Telehealth Center of the University of the Philippines, Dr. Raymond Sarmiento. So allow me now to tell you why this webinar series is very important. It is a very important program for TVUP because it epitomizes the mandate of TVUP. TVUP is a multimedia production center, an open educational resource, or what we call as OER, digital repository. It's meant to be uh, course materials accessed for free. And TVUP is a multimedia publication system. It pushes for the culture of sharing resources. It archives our materials and it has a search mode. You type in the topic, stop COVID-19, or the name of our resource persons or uh, our guest speakers, and then uh, name of Dr. Susie Pineda or Dr. Raymond Sarmiento. Lalabas na lahat yan dyan. So it will be very easy for you to access. It is meant to be accessed by all sectors, including the general public, reaching the whole world. You know, in a digitized, digitalized, and digitally transformed world with the COVID-19 pandemic experience, more so today, Bawal muna ang face-to-face -face classes. So, you know, it is the most important part of teaching and learning process. The use of e-pedagogy, answering the question of how will learners learn in today's environment? So, we might be in this educational environment for about a year or two. Uh, in all sectors, huh? basic education, higher education, training programs, professional continuing education, and lifelong learning. Today, you may call it remote learning, distance learning, open distance e-learning, flexible learning, and maybe just the standard teaching and learning eventually, it becomes the norm. 
whatever form it takes, there will always be the need for content and activities for learning. This setup is part of the magnified technological changes in communication. Uh, you have a web that is called Web 5.0 today. Dati, tawag lang dyan, Web, uh, web 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. Dati, tawag na Symbiotic Web, yung 3.0. Then, now it's uh, 4.0. It's called Symbionet Intelligent Web. So, automatically machines talk to other machines and linking the world at all times. And today, merging the concepts of Eduk 5.0, you have Society 5.0, and Web 5.0. It has changed people's lives and the way we think, the way we do things. Our everyday lives, it has changed. We have to, therefore, claim our space in the virtual world, grounded on our Philippine experience, through our Filipino scholars, researchers, experts, their thoughts, their stories, their narratives, and practice to be accessed by Filipinos nationally and internationally and help solve, solve problems and face the challenges of people all over the world. As we can see, the whole humanity is linked together. So, ang importante magsama-sama tayo at palakihin natin ang ating samahan ng mga mag-aaral at mga gurong naniniwala sa pamamahagi ng kanilang kaalaman. And that learners and teachers are co-creators of knowledge. So, maraming salamat po for this opportunity. Thank you, Susie. Thank you very Dr. much. Dr. Raymond. Thank you very yeah. much, Dr. Gigi. I mean, truly inspiring. And I, I just wanted to say this again, no? Um, I think in this new normal, we really can't be siloed. We really have to work with um, people of expertise in other areas, and we're certain, certainly so fortunate to have uh, Dr. Gigi with us, uh, bringing in all the years of experience in communication and television that we're now applying to, uh, television and film that we're now applying to the webinar. Anyway, um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ma'am Gigi. Uh, Raymond, you might want to acknowledge all of these other people who are on the, I'm sure you're scrolling the, the chat, no? Before you go into the poll, acknowledge natin yung iba pang mga nakikinig. Raymond, are you there? Okay, Raymond, you have, you're muted. You're muted right now, okay. Okay, Raymond's muted. Let me let me let me recognize. Can you hear me now? now I can hear you. Raymond, acknowledge the others okay. first before you going to the poll. But people are already answering it, huh? Sige, mag answer mo na kayo dyan. Yeah, pa. Sige, um, 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 Thank you po for everyone who have been talagang very diligent. We have been able to see that uh, over the course of the 13 webinars that there are at least uh, more than 20 people po who have been diligently following po each and every webinar that we that we conduct for each week and like I, like as mentioned po we are uh, the, all of this po is part of the efforts of multiple individuals and multiple entities po and the co-creation of the knowledge will not be possible without the cooperation and hard work and teamwork so Ang, ang totoo po talagang powerhouse sa lahat po ng nilista ni Ma'am Gigi ay siya po talaga, si Dr. Okay. Gigi Alfonso who is being a pioneer in distance learning, uh, leading as executive director of TVUP, uh, forging ahead po uh, the university's efforts uh, towards remote and distance learning. So maraming salamat po talaga for that inspiring talk, uh, Ma'am Gigi. Uh, for those who are in the call, obviously as uh, Dr. Susie mentioned, we have those uh, locally. Uh, from Tarlac, uh, from Cotabato, from Laguna. Uh, did you know po that uh, this webinar actually has prob has the most number of registrants? So that goes to show po the interest level of the people for our webinar.
our for this particular webinar but also uh, the resource person who will be delivering po uh, this webinar so that uh, a lot of people are very excited uh, to learn more about uh, what we will be talking about uh, this afternoon uh, as we go on to the poll uh, may we enjoy everyone to uh, answer the, the questions po and we have two questions uh, towards the end of the webinar, the, the answers po will be provided by our resource person. The first question reads, based on genomic sequence data and phylogenetic analysis, most of the SARS-CoV-2 most of the SARS-CoV-2 viruses po, where is the poll? Maybe we can share the poll po ulit. I'll read it for you, Raymond, kung nawawala. Sige, ma'am. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay po. Wala sa'yo. Based on genomic uh, sequence and phylogenetic analysis, most of the SARS-CoV-2 viruses circulating in the Philippines in late March 2020 most likely originated from India, brought by travelers from Southeast Asia, the United States, through international travel, Japan's Diamond Princess cluster of cases, or directly from Wuhan, China. Oh, sagot na kayo ah. Tingnan natin kung alam nyo sagot dyan. Parang babagsak yata ako dito. Okay. <laughs> the... Uh, D614G SARS-CoV-2 variant, which we've been reading about, now seen in local COVID cases in July, is more virulent and infectious compared to the D614 original strain. It needs further study to establish virulence. It is associated with increased or longer hospital stay. It contains mutations in the region of the spike protein that Seven uh, that uh, directly interacts with the ACE2 receptor. So, please answer. Ayan, so masagot na sila Raymond. Raymond, can you see it now? Opo. Good. Uh, slowly trickling in po yung mga answers, but I think that there's still some sort of um, uh, uh, parang ang, um, uh, there's uh, parang uh, how do you really answer the question, particularly for question number two po, which is uh, the heart of our topic po uh, for this afternoon, Ma'am Susie. So uh, I think uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll let you do the honors po, Ma'am Susie, in introducing our very distinguished and we are very honored po, uh, truly from the bottom of our hearts, to have her uh, be the resource person for our exciting webinar for this afternoon. Dr. Susie? Okay, thanks Raymond. So our topic is genetic genetic sequencing research and mutation of SARS-CoV-2. And I think that's been in the news that there's a mutation and we want to know more about this. But I think more importantly, what we want to know is what are the findings on genetic research of SARS-CoV-2 in the Philippines? And many people don't realize that we actually, when, when China released the genetic sequence of SARS-CoV-2, we didn't call it SARS-CoV-2 yet, of that virus, the reason why uh, Destura was, Dr. Destura was able to make a, uh, a test kit from the Philippines was because we had the capability at the Philippine Genome Center and in the National Institutes of Health to start creating our own tools for diagnosis. And I think as we progress this world of Molecular, molecular biology and biotechnology is going to be an increasingly important field. So those of you who are students out there who want to do further studies, I highly encourage you to, um, to go into this area of work, uh, molecular biology and biotechnology, because a lot of the problem solving is going to be in that field. Without further ado, okay. Our guest for today is one of the pioneers of molecular biology and biotechnology in the Philippines. And she was one of the pioneers in setting up the Philippine Genome Center. Um, she is a professor of molecular biology and biotechnology and the executive director of the Philippine Genome Center. So we are very happy to welcome Dr. Cynthia Saloma. Welcome to the webinar series, Paul. Thank you very much. It's a distinct opportunity for us at the Philippine Genome Center to be able to share the data that we have generated to our audience this afternoon. Ma'am, I heard that this is the first time you left your house and went to the office. Is that correct? Actually, Po, it's the second time. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, uh, no, I'm working from home and directing everybody to do certain things. 
<laughs> right, right, right. But the Genome Center has been engaged also in training of laboratories for uh, for, for SARS-CoV-2, no? Correct. And together with um, um, uh, MBB, the National Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology and NIH, and of course, also our Philippine Genome Center in Mindanao and Visayas, um, you have been helping train uh, our med techs and doctors understand the procedure as well as do hands on training on real time PCR. So, for, where, where, where are the centers in Visayas and Mindanao? Just for, so for, for us, uh, so we started out with the uh, main Philippine Genome Center here in. Uh, uh, Diliman. We also have the Philippine Genome Center Visayas and also Philippine Genome Center Mindanao. So they're all located in uh, UP Visayas as well as in UP Mindanao. And of course, we also have the Philippine Genome Center Health Program as well as the Program for Agriculture. So the health program's epicenter is, of course, UP Manila and agriculture is uh, UPLB. Okay, so lots. Lots and lots of work going on in this field of genetics in the Philippines that many of us are hearing about for the first time. Correct. This is the first time, ma'am, you're going to be presenting the results of your research on SARS-CoV-2, am I correct? Yes, this is the first time that we'll be presenting many of which, of course, are even uh, raw data. But because of the urgency of that situation, we would like to um, bring it out into the open so that it will also inform our researchers, our public, as well as our clinicians of what's going on and what is the value of genomics research in this time of the pandemic. Very good. Excellent. Ma'am, go ahead with your presentation. We will not keep uh, you away from the audience. Go ahead, Paul. So I will begin my presentation now. Yes, so uh, magandang tanghali po sa ating mga nanonood at saka nag-join ng ating seminar or webinar na ito. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, from us here, from the Philippine Genome Center, to be able to share with you our um, knowledge as well as our data uh, in this 13th Stop COVID's Death webinar series. So I would like to um, um, be, uh, express our deep thanks to the organizers and the people behind this program. So I am also joined today by our bioinformaticians because as you will know later on, a lot of the work that we have been doing would be sequencing and bioinformatics. So in case you have uh, technical questions, they are on standby to join me. So, um, so today we will be sharing with you a snippet of the work we at the Philippine Genome Center have begun since the COVID-19 um, pandemic started in January. I will talk how genomics and whole genome sequencing of the virus could inform our decision, our decision making, um, our clinicians make decisions on um, SARS management, as well as, of course, on SARS-CoV-2 virus testing, vaccine design, and clinical management of patients. So I would like to share with everyone, this is the organizational structure of the Philippine Genome Center. So as you can see here, we are, uh, the Philippine Genome Center is directly under the office of the Vice President for Academic Affairs of the University of the Philippines system. Um, of course, uh, above the OVPAA or our Vice President for Academic Affairs who is Dr. Cynthia, um, uh, uh, Cynthia Gray uh, Banzon Bautista. We have, of course, uh, President uh, Danilo Concepcion and the UP Board of Regents. So let me just give you an idea, uh, particularly for those who are not so familiar with our center. So we actually have two, uh, several programs. We have our, so divided into two main groups. We have the research and development uh, arm, as well as our core facilities. So for the research and development arm of the Philippine Genome Center, we have our health program. And the program director here is actually Dr. Evaco Chonko de la Paz, the program for agriculture, livestock, um, and fisheries, headed by, of course, Dr. Laurena from UPLB, our uh, biodiversity, ethnicity, and forensics program, which is headed by Dr. Ian Puntanilla, who will now be replaced by Dr. Um, Cara Diongria of the Natural Sciences Research Institute. And of course, we also have our computational genomics and systems biology program that is headed by Dr. John Yap. So to support all our R&D programs, we have our core facilities. We have our DNA sequencing core facility headed by Dr. Um, ben Maralit, the core facility for bioinformatics headed by Dr. Yap, 
our um, biobank and core facility by Dr. Ellen uh, Katap, and of course, our protein, proteomics, and metagenomics core facility headed by Dr. Neil uh, Mascos. Just to, um, so now we also have our clinical genomics arm, as well as, of course, our research arm, and our clinical genomics laboratory is headed by Dr. Mark Ezel is who is actually very, very busy every day because we are now involved with SARS-CoV-2 testing. So uh, in addition to the main uh, Philippine Genome Center here, uh, headquartered at UP Diliman, we also have our UP Visayas PGC satellite facility at uh, UP um, Visayas, and headed by Dr. Noel Ferrios and our UP Mindanao PGC satellite or PGC facility in UP Mindanao, uh, headed by Dr. Lyra Morao. So uh, to give you the outline of my presentation today, I'll give you a short background of COVID-19 in the Philippines, because this is very, very important in the context of our study of mutations and variations. I will also uh, give a short uh, introduction on the SARS-CoV-2 virus and its genome, and what is the importance of genomic information, the implication of whole genome sequencing data on the origin of the March coronaviruses that we have been studying here at the Philippine Genome Center together with our collaborators from the Philippine General Hospital and the National Institutes of Health. Was it from India or was it from Japan? And then I will continue with the sequence variations in the Philippine isolates, both using our March data as well as our recent data in July that has been facilitated through the sponsorship by Dr. Um, Gap Oligaspi of the UPPGH. Then we have some, um, we will share with our audience the transmission analysis of the SARS CoV 2 viruses we had and what is the significance of the sequencing effort that we're doing, the implications and mutations in vaccine design testing and treatment, and then of course, next steps. So I am also, I would like to acknowledge that part, some of the people in the audience are actually our partners in the uh, COVID-2 testing effort. And uh, we are very, very fortunate that they are also listening to this webinar because uh, they can have a glimpse of the importance of joining our effort to have a national um, database as well as a national effort to sequence the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 in the Philippines. So um, I'll bring your attention now to SARS-CoV-19, a short background on COVID-19 in the Philippines. So the first reported case in the Philippines was on January 23 with two Chinese tourists, one of whom um, unfortunately died. So at that time, there was no local testing effort and the NPS were actually sent to the Australian Reference Laboratory in the absence of local testing capability. So by January 28, 2020, our government imposed temporary visa restrictions from visitors from Hubei, China, and uh, uh, ordered the returning Filipinos from that place to be quarantined for 14 days. By this time, the RITM, or the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine, has recorded 18 cases. They have screened 18 cases, six with pending uh, confirmation. By January 29, one of the PUIs, or the persons under investigation, died. He was uh, HIV positive. There was still no confirmatory COVID-19 test uh, during this time. So the first confirmed case in the Philippines was on January 30, uh, among the 23 admitted patients. At this time, the global cases was already 19, um, with, of course, um, there have uh, Globally, um, there have been cases from different parts of the world and 18 countries outside of China and a total of about 7,818 cases reported. So during this time, the World Health Organization declared the novel coronavirus as a health event, as a, a, the global novel coronavirus health event as a public health emergency of international concern. And the Philippines, the Philippine government issued a temporary ban on all travelers coming from Hubei province, China. Today, as of July 16, in the DOH website, there are 61,266 confirmed cases with 1,643 deaths. We, of course, at the testing facilities know that um, uh, the cases are much higher than the 61,000 pending a confirmation by the Department of Health Epidemiology Bureau. So the SARS-CoV-2 viral and genomic structure, um, just to give you an idea, um, because it is very, very important in our effort towards uh, targeted sequencing, as well as 
whole genome analysis. So when I say targeted sequencing, normally we have primer pairs that target a particular region of the genome, but for whole genome sequencing, normally we will utilize next generation sequencing technology. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus genome is a single stranded positive sense RNA, which is about 23, uh, 30,000 bases in length. It contains 11 genes, one of which is the ORF1AB, which encodes a polyprotein that is cleaved into 15 non-structural mature peptides that form a replication transcription complex involved in genome transcription and replication. The regions of the virus that are known to be immunogenic include the different parts of the spike protein here, letter S, the nucleocapsid, the M protein, the membrane protein, and swell as, of course, the envelope protein and can all therefore be used for uh, vaccine development. The S protein encodes a glycoprotein responsible for recognizing host cell receptors. And we know that in humans, the receptor is, of course, the ACE2 receptor. The membrane M protein, on the other hand, is responsible for shaping virions whereas the envelope or E protein is responsible for virion assembly as well as release. Uh, the N or the nucleocapsid protein is involved in packaging the RNA genome and also perturbing the whole cell processes such as interferon productions. There are also six accessory proteins of 3A1 up to of course ORF10. So the significance of the early release of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 data by China on January 11, 2020 is cannot really be overemphasized. It allowed many institutions around the world to develop tests, to diagnose the virus, and for vaccine developers to design vaccines targeting potentially immunogenic regions based on sequence alone, and of course, for some uh, structural modeling studies. Diagnostic assays target a number of genes, as shown here, to detect the presence of SARS-CoV-2, including certain regions, such as the RDRP gene, the S and E genes. Yes. Um, one important challenge is really to find a target unique to SARS-CoV-2, and here one has to do side-by-side -side genome comparison to pinpoint SARS-CoV-2 specific regions using our usual uh, bioinformatics analysis. So in the beginning, we all have SARS, the original one that started in Hong Kong, and then we have SARS-CoV-2. To differentiate the two, scientists have to have the sequence information so that they can target or can design primers that would specifically anneal or bind to the region that is only for SARS-CoV-2 and not SARS-CoV and not SARS. So the most commonly used diagnostic assays rely on real-time or quantitative real-time PCR, which uses reverse transcription to convert RNA to DNA and allows for rapid automated detection and quantification. Samples can be derived from nasopharyngeal swabs, oropharyngeal or throat swabs, saliva, sputum, um, deep airway material collected via suction catheter, feces, as well as some other uh, sources or methods. The collection of sample collection has been demonstrated to have an impact on the sensitivity of the diagnostic assay. So at present, we have more than 80 licensed labs in the Philippines that can do real-time PCR uh, diagnosis for COVID-19 virus, including uh, how many four within the UP system. So we have the first one, the testing center from the National Institutes of Health, headed by Dr. Uh, Eva Cochonco de La Paz, um, followed by the one from the Philippine Genome Center, and then the one from UPPGH, a molecular research laboratory, and the latest to get the license is one from the UPLB team. So why do we need to sequence? A, a very good answer is shown here on the board, how coronavirus mutations can track its spread and probably disprove conspiracy theories. So there are a lot of um, people that um, leading conspiracy theories that this particular virus came from uh, this place or this organism. So with a whole genome sequencing, you can actually track, for example, sequence variations and um, disprove some of the conspiracy theories that are being um, 
suggested by a lot of people saying it's a bioweapon and so and so. So I would like to emphasize that the data in the field um, suggests that it was not developed as a bioweapon, but actually evolved naturally. Okay, so why do we sequence? Because it is very, very important for epidemiologists to study random mutations in the SARS-CoV-2 genetic code to inform containment measures. So here shown, for example, is a sample A and B, they share the same uh, mutations. And of course, you have also D, C, and D, which have unique mutations here and here. And then we can say that, uh, of course, uh, sample C has more mutations in common with A and B than it does uh, with uh, sample D. So the, we also sequence because we can analyze the similarities between the different uh, viruses and it allow our scientists and bioinformaticians and molecular modelers and as well as epidemiologists to build a genetic tree. So you have here uh, an example of a genetic tree. So based on the sequence, we know, for example, that viral samples A and B are most likely closely related and both are more similar to C here than uh, they more similar, they are both similar to C than they are to D. So the sequence information is actually very, very important because we can see how similar or how different viruses are. And that of course, for us, who, um, for many people who are doing diagnostics and vaccine design, they have to keep on uh, tracking all these mutations to see whether their original design for diagnosis as well as for vaccines are still valid. So we can also organize our samples into a tree according to the date that they were taken. So for example, this is like a phylogenetic analysis. It visualizes how the virus spreads over time. So you have here the time of sampling, as well as, uh, of course, uh, the geographical movement. And it is interpreted based on location of the sample. So for this one to be possible, it is very, very important that we have very good record keeping and, of course, contact tracing. So the genetic tree also helps imagine how the, or, or analyze how the transmission took place. So for example, you can have clusters uh, which are very similar uh, genetically. So most likely these uh, belong to patients with the same transmission chains. And the confidence level of the transmission tree improves as the number of the viral sample increases. And thus worldwide, we have a shared database, a publicly available database, where researchers from all over the world can deposit their sequences because it is very, very important. Uh, this um, imperative or this data sharing imperative is very, very important as all of us would like to contribute in order to um, utilize science um, as well as uh, social science and hard, um, natural sciences and social sciences in order for us to make informed decisions that would save lives of our patients. Showing to you that uh, there are several because of the genetic or genomic information, researchers can actually design potential targets for uh, inhibitors. So there are several regions here. So um, if we are designing important targets for inhibitors, it is very important that the target by which they originally designed their um, strategies or therapies are uh, still similar or robust so that their efforts will not be totally wasted. So every day, a lot of people are actually tracking changes in the virus all over the world. And anytime there is something very dramatic, it really costs um, a lot of people to uh, gather their heads together to see whether the the mutation that has been reported is just an artifact of the sequencing or if it's really a mutation in the virus genome. So today I'm going to be presenting to you data uh, which we have collected at the time when the Philippines did not have our own um, RT-PCR test. So our deputy executive director at the Philippine Genome Center is also a faculty at the UP Manila, Dr. Albistura, designed the Gen Amplify NCOV RT-PCR detection kit. And during this process, um, the field validation study was required and this was funded by the PCHRD and the project leader in this effort is of course, Dr. Marisa Alejandria. 
So uh, just to give you an example or just a short term version of the difference between capillary sequencing workflow and NGS workflow. So the moment we have uh, samples from nasal or oropharyngeal swabs collected from patients in this particular study that was done in March, we had patients enrolled from the Philippine General Hospital, as well as patients from the medical city. So those who have enrolled as part of the validation study of the locally developed genamplified SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR detection kit, where of course um, the samples from them were uh, tested first using the kit for SARS-CoV-2 by RT-PCR, and we confirmed um, the amplicons using capillary sequencing. So in capillary sequencing is one where you can just target a particular uh, region, the amplicon can be uh, again analyzed. So you will have uh, data or you will have information, sequence information of a short region of the genome. In this particular case, whatever was um, amplified by the target, by the, by the kit of Dr. Ristura, we sequenced in the lab in the Philippine Genome Center. So you can just imagine that this was a time when we had enhanced uh, community quarantine in Metro Manila. So we have to house our researchers within the Philippine Genome Center uh, guest rooms. On the other hand, we also have, of course, your NGS workflow. So NGS stands for Next Generation Sequencing uh, Technology. And when you say uh, NGS, essentially this is harnessing the proper, uh, the, the technology where we can do parallel or massive parallel sequencing of a particular fragment of the genome. And then we can do uh, using computer assembly and uh, annotation of the virus or, or, or any genetic material that has been sequenced. So in the, in the case of the SARS-CoV-2, we had the sample RNA that has to be quality checked and then the of course, um, we have to make a DNA, uh, the samples has to be readable by our next generation. So there's QC that is happening and then sequencing. And of course, this one we're in, we have a lot of our bioinformaticians staying overnight, day and night working in order to understand the whole genome sequence or to assemble the genome of the locally isolated viruses we have. So the samples were collected late March uh, at the PGH and of course at the TMC. So just to give you an idea of the simplified workflow for viral metagenomic analysis. So remember a while ago, I talked to you about capillary sequencing and now I'm talking about next generation sequencing and viral metagenomics analysis. So what is viral metagenomics? And which is what we did for the next generation sequencing. So viral metagenomics is a study of viral genetic material sourced directly from an infected host. So this approach allows our researchers to study these viruses without the need to culture them. So for SARS-CoV-2, they can only be cultured in a BSL-3 laboratory. The method involves high throughput sequencing of the extracted genetic material, followed by bioinformatics as well as computational analysis to reconstruct the viral genome sequence, annotate the gene content, as well as identify possible variations or mutations and how these variants can affect viral protein activity. So you can, of course, infer some protein-protein interactions as well as signaling pathways. These types of analysis can have profound clinical implications if coupled with proper patient medical history and other metadata. So this is the simplified workflow that we use for our analysis. So today I'm going to be uh, sharing with you our initial phylogenetic analysis, as well as variant analysis of samples uh, collected last March, and of course the most recent one collected last week. So this was the analysis period. So this is to give you context on the time at the time of when we were doing this analysis. So during the time, the majority of our analysis was done during the month of April, but the samples were collected essentially between March 22 to 28. Um, during this period, the number of confirmed cases grew from 2,311 in the Philippines. That was on April 1. And by April 30, it already grew to 8,488 cases. So this was the time when we were doing our analysis very, very early in March. So as of now, uh, we have 
more than 60,000 60, cases. So I would like to share with you the profile of the six COVID-19 patients we have coming from the Philippine General Hospital. So these were our volunteer patients. I'm only showing you the six. We actually did a lot more sequencing, but at this time we did not use any um, um, see, uh, target enrichment. So this was plain and viral metagenomics. And these were the ones where we have the best assembly. So I'm going to share with you some of the data that we have. Um, this is a contribution and, uh, and the analysis was done by Dr. Marisa Alejandria of the Philippine General Hospital. So all of the six patients came from Metro Manila and have had no travel history outside of the country. So these are community infections and they never had any travel in history on the month before contracting the SARS COVID-2 virus. The two patients had close contact with a confirmed case of COVID-19, one of whom gave direct care to a hospitalized uh, relative while the other was a physician. So we have a medical doctor here whose wife was exposed to a confirmed case. Both patients had no comorbid conditions and presented with mild uh, symptoms of fever, plus dry cough, myalgia, headache, as well as diarrhea. Four patients had severe COVID-19 uh, pneumonia and two with exposure to suspect cases, two with no known exposure to confirmed case, and one, um, two ne patients needed mechanical ventilation one of whom survived, the other uh, died. So um, viral shedding was prolonged in some cases uh, for those who survived. And the viral shedding actually occurred from six to seven weeks with one patient uh, still shedding even as uh, late as uh, June uh, 2020. So this was the contact tracing that was done by our collaborators from the Philippine General Hospital, uh, headed by the, uh, in this particular research by Dr. Alejandria. So these are assembly statistics we have. So do we have some contiguous regions? Um, the sequences were demultiplex. So this was based on um, next generation sequencing and viral metagenomics. So the uh, demultiplex raw sequence reads that have been subjected to quality filtering using the tool FASTP with default parameters were further filtered using two different and separate procedures. So um, we have here the total assembling length, which was calculated from the sum of the lengths of the scaffolds of the assembly. And of course, we have the spinal scaffold length. So the spinal scaffold length is essentially very, very similar to the length of the original SARS-CoV-2 uh, 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 virus uh, isolated from Wuhan, China. So for example, PGC-06, so these, these are all uh, PG examples. We have a very, very, um, very, very long contig, uh, which is about 22,000. And PGC-3 also, um, the contig length is about almost covers the entire uh, virus genome length. Uh, this, in this case, it's 28,295. So one contig alone uh, is actually essentially covering the entire virus. So let's look at the virus mutation statistics. So this is from the reported sequences. Numerous mutations have already been identified across the viral genome. So this is um, data coming from GSAID or the Global Initiative for the sharing of all influenza viruses. So as we speak now, there are about 67,000 deposits already in the state of SARS-CoV-2 collected from different parts of the world. And this is really an unprecedented pace by which the world community tries to share genomic data from the diff of the different viruses they have in their respective countries. So here you can see, for example, several regions of the genome, which has a lot of uh, point mutations from different countries around the world. So how does this compare with those that we have obtained from our local isolates? So uh, just to summarize, uh, we have, um, from the six PG8 samples, 52 variants were observed across six viral genome assemblies. Um, of these, 47 were observed to be unique to a particular isolate. Um, 
Of course, there's a lot of interest as to whether or not in this particular time were they 614G or D, genotype. And that is a data or, uh, that I'm going to share with you in a little while. So these were the sequence variations uh, vis-a-vis, -vis, of course, the global samples. In this case, uh, our young um, bioinformatician from the Philippine Genome Center, Carlo, did the analysis uh, for the sequence variations of our six isolates, six at least where we have very, very good assembly. So presented here is a plot of the nucleotide sequence variations observed in the six SARS-CoV-2 genomes that we have sequenced at PGC. Uh, this is as visualized in nextstrain.org. For comparison, the variants observed across the 4,415 genome sample globally between December 2019 and May 2020 are also shown at the bottom. So we have here the unique counts of the unique, unique mutational events observed across um, and um, across an inferred biology. So one of the variants in the Philippine samples, we have a missense mutation, for example, G11083T, which leads to an L to 3,606 uh, phenylalanine change in the ORF1A genome, or polyprotein coincides with the most, this one, coincides with the most recurrent mutation observed globally also, and may be uh, located in a high permeable site. The other five variants in total are found to be common to all the Philippine, uh, to all the six Philippine isolates. So here uh, there are some five sequence variations common to all the Philippines isolates that we have. So these log positions. So all our Philippine isolates um, contain all these variations. And I would like to present in a little while to you what are some of the consequences of these mutations and what are some of the um, computed or presumptive structural implications. So for this, we have to do some structural modeling, which was done by our um, head of the protein and proteomics core facility, Dr. Uh, An Neil Andrew Baskas. So what are the some uh, what are the possible structural implications of sequence variations in local isolates for treatment and vaccinations? So here is a summary: the location of the protein NSP3, six, the RDRP, the S protein we have. Uh, this is actually a silent mutation, and of course in the nucleocapsid region. So some of a lot of these are missense mutations. The one in the S region is a silent mutation, fortunately and the others is our missense mutations. So um, just to show to you some of the, so the sequence variations that we have observed locally, how do they compare with the other sequences around the world? So some of these are, so for example, all our sequences are um, shared, this particular region in the ORF1AB are shared um, by our sequences and also by occurrence uh, by the, by the submissions at the GC database. So these are not very unique um, mutations. They have been also found elsewhere among the different um, submissions in that GC uh, database. So I'm showing to you uh, all the local submissions in GC, including seven from the Research Institute from of Tropical Medicine and six from the Philippine Genome Center. So um, PGC4 is just a record, rec recording of our PGH uh, samples. So some of the samples were found in um, the submissions from our ITM and the others from the Philippine Genome Center. So some of the mutations are fairly common. There are also others, this one, uh, the S. There was a, the silent mutation in the spike region. Fortunately, it's a silent mutation and it's a fairly common mutation when you look at the GSA database. So no need to be alarmed about this one. Okay, so I'm just going to share with you some of the analysis that was done by Dr. Andrew, uh, Neil Andrew Baskus. Um, and just to share with you that we have the capability, for example, to look or to infer some of the structural implications the moment we see a variation in the genome sequence. So I'll just go through this very, very fast. Of course, these are all um, models and uh, actual, whether they are true or correct or, or not, depends on, of course, um, 
when you can do crystallization studies. But at any rate, it gives us information whether a particular region where a variation occurs is actually or is critical or not critical. So um, this is using ITACER. And a lot of our students at the Philippine Genome Center also do this kind of analysis for their thesis. So we have a lot of sequence variations, just, but just to summarize, many of the variations that we observe in the six um, Philippine isolates where we have the full sequence of available are not really um, alarming or are something that should cause alarm. Even the one for the spike protein, it was fairly common around the world and it's of course, uh, um, there is no change in the amino acid sequence, it's still a tyrosine. Okay, so um, given that, so we are still continuing our effort to track the mutations that we found in the country. Uh, we will be embarking on a na national um, effort to sequence the different viruses in the Philippines and uh, the people in the structural group or structural modeling group of the Philippine Genome Center and the National Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, as well as our collaborators from different institutions around the Philippines are on standby to lend their effort so that we can have a better picture if ever some mutations occur. So what are some of the implications of these uh, mutations on vaccination strategies? I'm talking about in general. So the stra several strategies for developing vaccines could be the utilization of inactivated live or inactivated viruses. You can do viral particles only. And lately, of course, nucleic acids as our um, immunogen. So the relevant proteins that are, can be targeted would be the spy protein, the nucleic acid, the membrane protein, as well as the others I have mentioned previously. So what I'm trying to um, share with you today, this is not a comprehensive list, but at least it gives you an idea of some of the current vaccine um, vaccines that are in development around the world. And everybody, everybody of course, is um, waiting if we can have a vaccine before the end of the year. So this is not a very exhaustive list, but it gives us a glimpse of the major vaccines in development. We see here live attenuated or inactive virus vaccines, which is the classic strategy for viral uh, vaccinations. Many companies such as Johnson & Johnson, and of course the one from the University of Oxford are utilizing materials which they have previously developed for Ebola as well as SARS. And they tweak this a little and repurpose them to develop the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine that are now in various stages of uh, trials. So we also have researchers from the University of Hong Kong, which have developed a live influenza vaccine that expresses SARS-CoV-2 uh, proteins. There are also subunit vaccines for SARS coronavirus that hope that are hoped to elicit an immune response against the spike uh, protein to prevent its docking to the host ACE2 receptor. So the CEPI or the Coalition for Epidemic uh, Preparedness, the University of Queensland and others are synthesizing viral surface proteins as well as recombinant S proteins um, target and also those which um, that target the receptor binding site in the hope of eliciting robust immune response in these uh, vaccines. Um, by the way, uh, very, very interesting, interestingly, there are also nucleic acid vaccines, such as the DNA vaccine being developed by Inovio and in partnership with the Beijing Advanced Biotechnology. Well, we also have Moderna, which is um, in the news almost every day. One of the close, this has one of the most closely watched vaccine companies that are that is testing using RNA vaccine. So please note that there is no commercially available nucleic acid based vaccine for humans. And the progress of Moderna and other vaccines is closely watched by everyone. In this context, knowledge of circulating viruses, whether um, mutating or not, it's very, very important because then our vaccine developers would know whether the regions which they use to design their uh, vaccines are still there or not mutating. So what are some of the key features of a target product uh, for vaccine uh, de uh, development for COVID-19? 
it must be, it has to have, uh, we have, they have to minimize undesirable. This is undesirable immunopotentiation. It should be suitable for adult healthcare workers, suitable for adults also. We are very vulnerable, those beyond 60 years of age, as well as those with underlying um, comorbidities such as diabetes or hypertension. And this one, of course, it has to be suitable for stockpiling. So for now, what do we have? What have we learned so far? That NGS data or next generation sequencing data can help shed light on cases of community infections, traceability of the virus, which I'm going to further discuss with you today, travel history of patients among others. And um, it can also be used to track worldwide SARS-CoV-2 sequence variations and mutations. So, so far, uh, at least for the March samples, the circulating uh, viruses in the, at least the sixth, what little we have, uh, did not vary that much with the original Wuhan isolate. Now let's be continue with our SARS-CoV-2 uh, transmission analysis. So these were done by uh, Francis and the team from the Francis Tablizo, uh, Carlo, and the team from the bioinformatics core facility of the Philippine Genome Center. So how did we utilize the data we obtained last March? So this tree is from the global subsampling of SARS-CoV-2 genomes from the next train online analysis platform. So you can see here that we have highlighted the branch where the Philippine samples were clustered in a tree. So where am I going in this discussion? I want, because we have a question, where did the early samples come from? Did they come? from India, did they come from Japan, Australia, the United States, and so on and so forth. And they would like to present to you the value of genetic information in order to resolve the particular question. So within this branch here highlighted, um, we can see a number of samples from India and the Philippines. So this one is from India and the Philippines. That's why it can easily be interpreted that almost likely the Philippine samples come from India, even if we don't have, we cannot really make any um, association as far as travel history is concerned. So this is from the next train database where we took a picture. So based on this tree, it can be hypothesized that certain samples from India are ancestral to the Philippine samples. Okay, but wait, okay. So you see here, so this is your um, genomic epidemiology of novel coronavirus, global subsampling, this is big. So is it, could it be that the sample came from India, from China, where you have uh, the Wuhan, the original Wuhan isolates, then they went to pass through India and then going to the Philippines based on the next train data. So, um, so, um, so it's, it's very tempting to speculate that this seems to be the, the route of the virus, even if we don't really have so much a direct evidence, right? Okay, however, okay, what are the direct or the caveats or direct interpretation of that next trend data? That's why probably many of you have read in the newspaper that probably the Philippine samples came from India. So let's look at the caveats of the next train database that uh, many of us are also looking at because there is really subsampling. So for example, in the GCA database there are about 67 submissions, but the next train database only use a portion of that um, information for its analysis. So there is a subsampling which can affect the transmission analysis of researchers or of the next train database itself. And then the construction of geographical spread is highly dependent on the accuracy of that reported transmission dates. And the transmission of a given branch is assumed to be linear, which may not necessarily be the case. Okay, so. Um, the next train database, um, is very important to realize, has really no access to the information regarding the circumstances surrounding the collected samples that I have previously um, pointed out, right? And the reconstruction of this geographic spread within a certain cluster is simply assumed to be linear on the basis of trans, uh, reported transmission dates. So here, um, um, now let's look at this again. So based on the Asia focus tree, so meaning to say a lot of the samples, you look at this, this is the next train database. If you want now to 
um, choose more of the Asian samples. So this is Asia focus three. The path of transmission, uh, the path of transmission inferred by the next train platform is now from China to Japan, and then Japan to India, and India to the Philippines. Note that this hypothesized geographic spread still assumes a linear path of transmission based on the collection dates. Okay. Now, to show to you the effects of subsampling, we will use the same data set from the next train database, but we filtered to include more samples coming from Asia. And this will allow, actually, if you're a user of next train, it allows you to uh, modify certain parameters so that, for example, in your analysis, instead of global data set, you would like to focus on Asia um, rather than from the different continental sources. And here on the left panel, you have, you see here, the data set that you want to use for Asia. And we can now see Asia instead of the global that was used in the previous slide. So this tree is um, Asia focus, subsampling is our scope two. So this is essentially generated from the same data set as the global subsampling, uh, subsamples earlier, but of course we have more samples coming from Asia included in the next train analysis. So what do we get? So we can at least observe at least one sample from India, what else? Uh, that was collected earlier than the Philippine samples. And there is a slight change in the hypothesized transmission path generated by the analysis platform. So what do we see here? However, <clears throat> so just to show to you that now, um, uh, the, the, I will continue that story later on. The number of SARS-CoV-2 sequences in the GC database upon which next train also draws its sequences have dramatically increased. So for example, for example, in the early part, you have your Europe, uh, North America, this was in March and April. In the beginning, of course, there were a lot of sequences coming from uh, Wuhan, China, and also, of course, from Hong Kong, Singapore, and other Asian countries. Then it became dominated by samples coming from Europe and North America in March to April. And then, of course, some of, from Oceania, from uh, Australia, New Zealand, Australia. And then lately, we have now more samples coming from uh, Africa. So as far as the reported cases, I'm showing this to you because the analysis that you do should be understood or utilized in the context of the, the sequences available in these databases. So when we did the analysis using uh, this phylogenetic tree that was generated by Francis to shed light on whether our samples really came from India or from uh, other countries, I'm now going sh to share with you this phylogenetic tree generated by uh, Francis together with our team from the bioinformatics core facility. It took this, uh, an the analysis of this tree took a while. This is based on a subsample of 1,325 subsequences from the GSA database, uh, which is also of course the same from the one that was used by next train. Among the 1,325 samples, now we have already samples coming from our IPM and of course the samples that the Philippine Genomes have uh, Center submitted that were sourced from our uh, volunteers from the Philippine General Hospital. So in our analysis, we're now including 13 uh, Philippine submissions to so the GSAID database. Seven of these comes, came from the RITM and six from the Philippine Genome Center. So what do we see here? So we have clustering the samples from our ITM together with PGC. We see clustering here in this analysis. In addition to that, we will also show, for example, so we can see actually a BCG and we will look at this very carefully. So this uh, sample B is here. So these are the samples coming from our ITM and the PGC clustering here. Right, and then of course we have C samples, clusters in C as well as clusters in Z. So what are these? So the majority of the samples on March 26 or earlier that were submitted by the Philippines, um, except for a number of samples from India, were accessed. Uh, uh, were actually older than the Philippine samples, and can we can use this some of the samples in, can be used for their possible origins. From this analysis, the Philippine samples clustered in groups B, 
C and D. And um, for example, here, where do we find our samples? We have samples uh, clustering with India and Japan. Note that the samples from Japan were collected from the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Uh, this was an outbreak in mid-February. <clears throat> And these were observed. Look at this one. So if you look at the Japanese samples, BP meaning to say diamond princess. Okay. And you will remember that in this particular cruise ship, Filipino and Indian seafarers were repatriated from this cruise ship sometime in late February. So take note. So you will see here. So the C and D on the other hand, show the clustering of Philippine samples with those primarily collected from Shanghai, Shanghai, China, as well as of, uh, in mid-February, CMD. Okay. So did our samples really come from India? The samples we have last March most likely came from the Diamond Princess cruise ship in the same manner that the samples from India also came from the Diamond Princess cruise ship because we know that there are a lot of seafarers, Indian as well as Filipino seafarers who were crew members of the Diamond cruise ship. So with this, we can probably say that the samples we have did not come from, at least last March, did not come from India, but were probably from the Diamond Princess cruise ship that was moored in Yokohama, Japan. Okay, so let's look at this in context. So deep. So just to look at the uh, timeline, this is very, very important to study the timeline. So this was the time when the Diamond Princess cruise ship, uh, we have Filipino seafarers who were repatriated. So this was the last day, February 26th, they were repatriated. And then of course the WGS data from our ITM was sampled. The earliest one we have in the GC submission was uh, sampled on March 8th, okay? So all our seafarers, of course, were, were um, quarantined in Clark, okay? So the PGC uh, uh, samples coming from PGA's volunteers were actually um, analyzed or collected between, take note, March 22 to 26. So if these people or if our seafarers um, did 14 day quarantine by that time that should have ended when? Probably in March 12 or 14. Okay, so this was, it is possible that the RIT and WS data came from one of those repatriated sailors. But however, for the community transmission of, of our PGA samples, so March 22 to, to 28, we they are very, very similar to the Diamond Princess cruise ship. So that tells you that, of course, our government tried to uh, quarantine our sailors, but possibly there are still some which were able to transmit it into the community. So the story started when, let's look at the Diamond Princess crew. So this was, uh, um, the story started when a passenger who disembarked in Hong Kong late in January tested positive for the virus. By February 3, three passengers and crew of the Diamond Princess were essentially quarantined aboard uh, uh, the ship. And of course, in, uh, in the United States, for example, 18 of 329 citizens were reported to be positive according to the CDC. The crew members were uh, reported to share cramped quarters. Of course, this is in the Diamond Princess. Some work in housekeeping, handling infected beddings of passengers, clothes, towels, and the like. And they might be infected materials infecting the crew members. So the Philippines, with nearly half a million seafarers, manning cargo ships, cruise, ship, cruise ships, uh, remains the main and the largest source of cruise ships or seafarers around the world. So that is the context. Uh, that's why we have uh, a lot of um, uh, possi possible international introduction of positive cases. So when we look at that context, so as far as the data from the 13 Philippine SARS-CoV-2 genome sequences can support, we hypothesize that there are at least two sources of viral transmission in the country, China, mainly from Shanghai, and Japan from the Diamond Princess. 
the observed similarity between the samples from the Philippines and India is most likely linked to the Diamond Princess outbreak. Although we cannot discard the possibility of a direct SARS-CoV-2 transmission from India to the Philippines, this is a less likely scenario given the series of events that transpired during the period. So it is also very important, everyone, that to note that the, Philippine thir the 13 Philippine samples are mostly cases of community transmission, and the data we have presented here only highlights a very small proportion of the SARS-CoV-2 transmission in the country. We need to sequence more samples, particularly the earlier cases, if possible, to provide a more comprehensive picture of the geographic spread of SARS-CoV-2 in the country. So to synthesize our data, and as far as the data from the Philippines SARS-CoV-2 genome sequences can support, we think we have one, uh, the one mainly from Shanghai, not directly from Wuhan, and the other from Japan through the Diamond Princess. So that's at least for the 13 samples that are now in the GSAID database. Um, so uh, this one would, should really spur our effort to sequence more uh, local isolates of SARS-CoV-2. So we look at now this one, the mutations that we have observed, and look at this one. So this is a question that has been posed to us. So we have to do the analysis uh, very rapidly and we're very thankful to Dr. Gaspi for sponsoring the um, capillary sequencing effort. So take note everyone here, you have your surface glycoprotein D to G614 mutation, which is the most common um, variation that has been found in the surface glycoprotein. So remember that the S protein, or some several vaccines are designed uh, against this S um, using the data from the spike uh, genome, spike protein. So there's a lot of interest about this G1, uh, D G14 um, uh, G, uh, sequence variation. So what we did was we analyzed all the samples in March and also those which we have collected in July. So just to give you some background, the spike protein, the spike protein takes over. So this is a comparison of the proportion of the D to the 614 gene mutation. Lately, it has been increasing worldwide. And this mutation affects a single amino acid position at the spike protein of the virus. And some studies suggest that this may enhance the infectiousness of the virus. However, the mutation does not appear to affect, uh, to affect disease severity, and there are no direct evidence to support that this variant is more transmissible. It does not also, the, the mutation is not also located in the region that directly uh, contacts the ACE receptor. So now, so when we look at the uh, residue of our different PG8 samples, so we have here about one, two, three, four, 11 PG8 samples that we were able to amplify either through NGS, next generation sequencing, or through targeted capillary sequencing in that particular region, all were of the D genotype, okay? So these were all of the D genotype. We don't have a complete a history or contact tracing, and uh, uh, these are available by, with uh, Dr. Alejandria. But at any rate, I would like to emphasize that early in March, everything, all including those submitted by the RITM were of the 614D genotype. Okay, how about this month, uh, last month? So we did random sampling of some of the um, positive samples in Quezon City. And this is done with the help of Dr. Mark Edsel Ayas, our laboratory manager at the clinical genomics lab doing COVID um, sequencing. And they would like to point out to you that of many samples we did, in June, we, uh, we did a lot of samples coming from July, but all, all the July samples we have are all of the D614G, of, of the G genotype. Uh, they only have one from June 22. The other, this is a mother and daughter and um, uh, affected cases. And these are all in the same family, all have G genotype. We do not know whether um, there are also circulating D um, genotype at the six, position 614, but when we randomly sampled or to meet 
or um, positive cases here in Quezon City, we now we know that they are mostly, if not almost all, are of the G uh, genotype in contrast to our earlier samples coming from the Philippine General Hospital, which were all of the D genotype. We need to um, we need to think about this um, data with caution because there is no direct evidence. Several papers have point out that we don't have any direct evidence of um, G being um, more infectious than the D genotype. And pending subsequent or additional uh, data coming from researchers around the world, we have to uh, think about this observation with caution. So what do we do next? So what are the future directions of the Philippine Genome Center? So it is a important, as you have shown here, we are only looking at the snippets of SARS-CoV-2 virus sequences that have, uh, we have done. This is very, very important that we should have more information, particularly of the early events when it was introduced into the country. So we are happy to note that we have several sequencing efforts um, and research efforts that are hopefully going to take off later this month about uh, this uh, particular area of research. So we have Dr. Jan Michael Lapp, who is involved in genomic epigenomical monitoring of COVID-19 in the Philippines. And very, very importantly, the, the research of Dr. Benedict Maralit, together with 20 other uh, potential collaborators from around the Philippines, from the Zondices and Mindanao, to do biosurveillance of South or SARS-CoV-2 infections in the Philippines. And this hopefully will be funded by the PCHRD. This is very, very important because as I have pointed out to you, we need to track whether uh, the viruses that are in the Philippines are of which genotype, whether they are mutating in certain regions and we can cross check or we can cross um, validate this. Also with, um, with um, target, um, vaccines or the target regions by which many of the vaccines in development worldwide are uh, were designed against. So we need to continue the biosurveillance in order to inform us whether certain vaccines which are now in development will be useful because we know the target regions of those vaccines, particularly the nucleic acid-based vaccines. So we are also going to do the Philippine Virome Database very, very soon um, in collaboration with uh, hopefully to be funded by the Department of Science and Technology. So towards the end, I would like to thank our collaborators and the entire team of the Philippine Genome Center, the National Institutes of Health, Philippine General Hospital, and the Manila Health Tech team for their tireless effort in order to be of contribution to the um, effort or the response of the Philippines towards this particular pandemic. I would like to especially point out our team from UPPGH headed by Dr. Alejandria, the bioinformatics team and our very young researchers who are staying day and night to do the bioinformatics analysis. Our NGS team, we've been doing a lot of analysis during the ECQ period headed by Dr. Maralit, the UPNIH team with Dr. Eva Cotionco de La Paz and Dr. John Mark Velasco and the entire team. So it's of course, Dr. Raul Vistura and the people from the Manila Health Tech. And of course, last but not the least, Dr. Gap Oligaspi for sponsoring the targeted sequencing of the G, uh, B614D um, variants. So this is the entire team of the Philippine Genome Center from uh, Dr. Distura, Dr. Ayes, Dr. Nevi Ferrios from Visayas and um, uh, Dr. Eva in UP Manila NIH. And of course we have Dr. Uh, Lyra Morao, our young people in the bioinformatics team and the sequencing team. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, everyone for your contributions and also for those who have attended today's seminar. Thank you very much. Very Thank much. you so much. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Susie. Go ahead, Raymond. Go na. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Executive Director of the Philippine Genome Center, Dr. Cynthia Saloma. So we learned a lot po, no? and uh, we understand that a lot of these are pre-publication data. 
So we will ask po for your advice on which parts of the presentation po uh, na pwede po nating ma-share kumbaga sa ating mga um, attendees. But before we forget, uh, let me just remind po ang ating mga attendees that we have a poll in terms of the evaluation of our uh, presenter. Okay, I think we lost we lost Raymond for a few seconds there. Raymond, are you back one? Yes. Can you hear me, Paul? Yep, you're on now. Go ahead. Okay. So the presentation po kasi, we as tradition, we always ask our attendees in terms of the assessment po. How did you find our uh, presenter po? And it's particularly the content of the of her presentation. And as always, uh, because of uh, well, especially the exceptional skill po of uh, Dr. Saloma in uh, sharing po the uh, well, essentially the findings po and the knowledge po uh, through this webinar, uh, we continue to see that there is a high regard for the presentation and always uh, the appreciation po in terms of the skills that were used, uh, the jargon that was used po in particular, hindi po masyado uh, too technical, and in particular how the webinar uh, technical details like the audio and the video uh, are highly satisfactory po and very, very excellent po. So congratulations po, uh, Ma'am Cynthia. Uh, this was a very successful presentation and before I forget, as of 1 o'clock p.m. po uh, of uh, this afternoon, there were all 1,500 registrants po. Uh, wow. Unique registrants po webinar and that is the highest recorded po, uh, registrations for our webinar series. So congratulations po. It was a really informative and very inspiring uh, webinar session po. Over to you, Dr. Susi. Thank you very much, Imad. Dr. Saloma, thank you so much. I was having a patriotic moment there uh, when you presented the team. And uh, it's, uh, it, makes, it brings some tears to my eyes when I think about all the young people who are working with you the amazing research that you're doing and how you're able to use science to help us make better decisions. Yeah. Uh, when I was listening to you, I said, you know, the Department of Foreign Affairs needs to hear this. They yeah. need to see this presentation. Our IATF needs to see this. And we need to understand. And we, it's very clear now that you, we actually have the tools to track where the weaknesses are in terms of community transmission. And this is very, very important for policy. So I just want to thank you. Um, and at this moment, I think, you know, this is going to be a kind of a heavyweight discussion because we have Isa Alejandria, who is uh, one of the study leaders here, or, and, and she's the Philippine representative to the Solidarity Trial. I'm going to see if we can get Isa uh, to open her camera and to open her mic. And we also have um, NIH Executive Director Eva Cutioco de La Paz. We have to mute something. Raymond, that might be you. Okay. So can we ask um, uh, Dr. Uh, Eva to open her camera and mic? And then we're also going to ask Dr. Alejandria to open her camera and mic so that we can have a bit of uh, a discussion here. Okay, there we go. So I think we're going to see Eva. We're going to see... Isa, are you there? There we go. So we've got... Maybe we can do four... Uh, when we have four people on the... Four people on the screen. Um, Isa, Dr. Uh, Saloma... Eva and either Raymond or myself, is that possible? Okay, I'm gonna ask Isa to say a few words and then we're going to ask uh, Eva to say a few words. And then Raymond, there are so many questions, there are 32. I think we need to read through the questions so that we are able to target uh, you know, really relevant questions that Dr. Cynthia can, can answer. But again, no saludo, Dr. Cynthia, you make, us all proud of our country, seeing what you can do. Okay, so uh, Isa, say a few words first about the study. Oh, okay. Uh, first, thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Sincha. Congratulations for a very 
comprehensive talk. I was really very excited to listen, no? Because I haven't really uh, seen the full picture of the sequencing part of what we did. Because what uh, we did in this uh, collaboration is uh, we collected the specimens from our patients. So we got consent from our patients and to be involved in the study, to be able to validate the kit of Dr. Distura. And uh, we collaborated with Mam Sincha to do the uh, uh, sequencing. So uh, I'm very happy that, to see really the collaboration between the clinical field and then the molecular field. Thank you very much, Mam Ma Sincha. Okay, kasama din ngayon, kasama din ngayon isa yung communications field, di ba? <laughs> so, so we're bringing we're bringing it all together for the audience. Okay, Eva, you want to say a few words? Hindi pa ito yung closing mo, Eva. Ah. Meron ka pang mamayang vision statement. Reaction yes. naman sa presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cynthia Saloma. Of course, she's my boss at the Philippine Genome Center. And uh, thank you to the whole team of the Philippine Genome Center for coming up with such a, a very comprehensive presentation. Dr. Mercado, you are correct. Uh, this uh, information has to be uh, um, discussed or transmitted to our policymakers, uh, the people who who are uh, actually making uh, the decision for public health uh, measures for the country. And uh, I also invited some members of the uh, Vaccine Research Development and uh, Sufficiency in the Philippines. Uh, as you may know, um, the uh, pres President Duterte actually um, is giving a, a big uh, reward for anyone who will be developing the vaccine, right? And the uh, Department of Science and Technology is spearheading uh, the um, uh, uh, strategies for vaccine development for the country. So they're here in the audience. Uh, perhaps they can also give their input where, where they are. I know Dr. Nina, Professor Nina Gloriani, of the UP, UP, uh, UP Manila uh, Public Health, uh, College of Public Health is also in the audience. Maybe they can uh, give some um, um, uh, some of the steps that they have taken so far. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Cynthia. And thank you, Dr. Pineda, uh, Pineda Mercado for making this uh, the 13th webinar series of the UP Phil. We're gonna thank Gap Legaspi for that because this was this was his idea. He said we have to put them on. We have to put them on. Okay, so let's uh, let's start with some questions. Um, you want to start with one of the questions, Raymond? So one of the questions po that we have here, uh, it has been upvoted by the group po. It states po uh, for Dr. Saloma, in reference to the initial inference that most of the March cases uh, were from the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Are these sequences ancestral to the sequence of the current cases? And second question po to Dr. Saloma, it was shown that early cases did not, did not show a D614G mutation while cases in late July showed uh, otherwise. So ang ibig po bang sabihin nito that most of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, viruses around the world convergently mutated towards a D614G mutation? Ma'am Cynthia? Okay, so uh, can you um, uh, restate the first question for, first so that I can answer them? So the first question okay, is... Ma yes, ma'am. The first question for Ma'am Cynthia is in reference to the initial um, inference. Okay, well, most... are, are the sequences now ancestral or not? So I would like yes, to point out that, for example, we were able to do all the GSAID analysis because we have the whole genome sequence of the March samples, and that was supported by the PHR, PCHRD grant that we have uh, through Dr. Marisa Alejandria. So we can do all kinds of phylogenetic, phylogenetic analysis. The one I have shown you now, uh, the one in July, we, have, we were not able to do whole genome sequencing first. Yet, not yet. So I cannot say uh, at any great length if they are ancestral or not. We just looked at a particular region of the genome because it has been of interest. So many people have been asking us on whether we have the genotype and so on and so forth. So we will be able to answer that the moment our uh, massive sequencing effort comes in. And hopefully that the OSD will release our budget so that we can get on this <laughs> immediately. <laughs> and the second question, yeah. 
Yes, yes ma'am, Cynthia. The second question po, it reads na uh, during the early days po, the cases did not show a D614G mutation. Pero the cases in July started to show uh, that sort of mutation. So ang ibig po bang sabihin that the SARS-CoV-2 viruses around the world had uh, like a convergence po mutation towards a D614G? If you look at the sequences now, um, it is really, really to tempting to say that. We don't really have uh, direct evidence to, uh, I have shown to you. You are probably able to sequence 19 only of the current samples. Um, you have to also note that the D614G mutation is mostly of European origin and Ameri North American origin. So if you have more samples being deposited in the databases coming from Europe and from the US, you will like to believe that most likely they are predominating around the world. So we did not also know how to answer that question. That's why we did random sampling and practically all we have now is a G genotype. What is the significance of this and the implications of this remains to be seen because we also need to see the clinical data of the patients. And that's why it is, we are trying to emphasize that it is very important that the people doing the genomics work closely with our epidemiologists and the clinicians so that we can have, um, and the contact tracers, of course, so that we can have an idea as to whether, for example, there is really massive, uh, there is an in, in increase in infectiousness or infectivity, or whether or not all the other samples we have are now of the G genotype. But it was really, really surprising to us to get all the G data. And that's very fresh. Upon orders of Dr. Gap, let us be. So we have to pass track, that's why I said to the team, give me the data by the 15th. So they were able to give wow. it to me, so that's very fresh. <laughs> right, um, I have a question, Raymond. I mean, because this is really very, very important. I mean, it would be interesting to find out if sequencing was done in Cebu, for example, or in other areas where you have outbreaks. Because we know in the Tondo area, Kampalo, yeah. I mean, it would be good to see because the thing is, you know, people kind of guess on what the breach is, why there is a spread. But if you have these tools and we can deploy them with contact tracing, then uh, we are in a better position to understand where you want to stop transmission. For example, for this, for the uh, dream, uh, dream Princess cruise, you know, for, for us in public health, we've been talking a long time about the need to have some kind of international quarantine port for seafarers in the Philippines because we are one of the biggest sources of seafarers in the world. And yes. once they're on a ship, we don't have choppers that can pull them out. I mean, so so this is, I think, a very, very, I, I think of all of our webinars, this is the one that has very deep policy implications. And um, so, okay, so I think my question is this, how long does it take you to do sequencing in a particular sample? So let's say we have an outbreak in a certain place. Um, how many samples would you need to take? I, I, I suppose you're doing a random sampling. And how quickly could you tell us what the genetic sequencing looks like? So my dear, if you, so I'm going to do not capillary sequencing. We're going to do whole genome sequencing because we have now uh, entire primers that can do ta target enrichment. So we will have better, when I say target enrichment, specifically targeting the SARS-CoV-2 genome, probably three days, we can get the data. In three oh, days. Okay. Yeah. So that would be great for the local governments because there's all this push and pull about can people enter, can people not enter, where did they get their infection and so on. And this one, it, it's almost like, um, I mean, it, it's really, it's really, uh, it's really hard evidence which could tell you Correct. how the infections have come into a, a particular place and we can get rid of all the blaming and all the stereotyping and all the stigma with this kind of evidence. Okay, I think Raymond, you have some more questions there. Yes, Paul. Uh, so not just for our Zoom attendees, but we have also been trying to track po the questions from our YouTube viewers, which are numbering po in the high hundreds. Uh, so the question po that is most recent in mind would be, according po to the recent news, that there are only three types of mutations po for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, however, based on this webinar, there are multiple mutations. So how do we actually 
reconcile daw, 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 daw that statement po, Ma'am Cynthia? So, definitely the three medications is wrong. So, of course, it's wrong. Even within our Philippine isolates, we notice that there are several sequences which are unique to the Philippine isolates that are not shared elsewhere, but our analysis seems to show that they are benign. When I say benign, there's not um, really effect, affect um, that much on the structure. So uh, the genomic information is very, very important for us to track transmissibility, source of infection. And I would like to point out that there is actually an emergency use utilization um, permit for a big sequencing company called Illumina. They received it early in June, where it can be do, it can, you can do diagnostics together with diagnostics together with uh, sequencing data with phylogenetic, phylogenetic analysis as part of the report. Hopefully, that can also be done uh, or approved by the FDA in the Philippines. So, yung sagot sa tanong ni Dr. Sarmiento. Mm -hmm. Dito po, <laughs> Thank you po. Thank you po for that uh, unequivocal po na answer po, Ma'am Cynthia. I think that's uh, that's something po of uh, of note because a lot of our viewers po depend on the information from the news like GMA news or, or, or any of the popular media. So that's very important but that we hear it straight from the expert po, Ma'am Cynthia. Our next question po, Ma'am naman po that was um upvoted would be how is uh, next generation sequencing more efficient than RT-PCR? That is our second most upvoted question. Okay. So everybody, if, when, when, now that we are also doing testing at the Philippine Genome Center, NIH, and of course, PGH and UPLB, in RT-PCR, you remember we have the RDRP gene, the N gene, the E gene, and ano pang isa? Yeah, N-E-R-D-R-P and the NSP1, for example, for the Singapore kit. So these are all targeting a particular region of the genome. And sometimes when you do testing, sometimes positive just E, not positive just RDRP, and so on and so forth. So we're only amplifying a particular region of the viral genome. Whereas if you do whole genome sequencing, for example, we're essentially targeting 98 sequences in one go. So in that sense, and the RDRP, uh, the RT-PCR analysis or testing that we have only tells us yes or no, meaning to say present, absent. It does not tell us whether there are sequence mutations in the middle of the amplicon in the RT-PCR and so forth. So yes and no. In many ways, it just gives you a diagnosis of present or absent, but it does not give you any data on whether they the the positive here is related to the one to the other one and so on and which you can glean from the sequence information yes okay. ma'am thank you so much for for, for that uh, insightful response po our next po i think dalawa, dalawa po kasi sila ma'am na ano eh, upvoted po na uh, question so the next upvoted question po it reads there are conflicting media reports on the mutation of SARS-CoV-2 virus, particularly regarding the, the spike protein and its interaction with ACE2. Is it correct to say that the mutations observed in the spike protein gene, being the silent mutations that they are, uh, can they be considered harmless mutations, uh, Dr. Cynthia? Uh, think, they, uh, they also... Yeah, at this point in time, go. yeah. At this point in time, um, um, probably, most likely, the data seems to suggest that they are harmless mutations. These are silent mutations. But of course, when we talk about mutations um, in terms of functionality, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of uh, translation efficiency, it's a different story. But in terms of, for example, since the structure is still tyrosine, I think it's harmless. Even the one that's 614G, so it's also in the spike protein. But the data seems to suggest, and of course, structural analysis shows that this particular variation does not, is not really in the region of the spike protein that directly interacts with the ACE receptor. Okay. So we okay. have to understand this with, we have to treat this data with caution. Okay, Raymond, I think, uh, you know, there are so many questions and what we're going to do is we're going to try to answer them on email. And maybe Raymond, now we can go to answering the fun questions we had at the beginning of the webinar. Yes, can we, can we have the poll questions, Bobby? Okay, uh, th thank you. Uh, for our let's say webinar questions po that uh, we asked our audience early on. The question reads, based on genomic sequence data and phylogenetic analysis, most of the SARS-CoV-2 viruses circulating the Philippines in late March most likely originated from? 
Ano po yung sagot, Ma'am Cynthia? From the Diamond Princess. Yan. Oh, okay po. So, oh, okay. ano po yan, ha? <laughs> no, meron. Merong konti. Merong konting naisip nila na yun, ano? But, the, you know, so the, the sort of, that's why I was saying, uh, we're quick to jump to conclusions, but with genetic evidence, I think we will be more precise about uh, how we act. But of course, if you have more data, we can give more conclusive proof. Yes. Okay, oh. second question, Raymond. Okay po. The second question po reads, uh, the D614G variant uh, now seen in local COVID-19 cases in July is? What's the answer, ma'am? Needs further study to establish its virulence and infectivity. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Ma'am Cynthia. So, um, uh, maybe you have uh, la last messages po for our attendees, po, Ma'am, before we go ahead and wrap up our webinar with our closing remarks speaker. Go okay. ahead, Ma'am Ma Cynthia. So, um, what this webinar and what I talked to you about is an indication of the early investments that the Philippine government did so that we can have this capability to do sequencing in the Philippines itself. We don't have to send samples abroad for these to be sequenced. We can do it instantly within the Philippine Genome Center. And that's very, very important that we would like to acknowledge the Department of Science and Technology, as well as the Commission on Higher Education, and of course, the University of the Philippine System for the investment in that sequencing in technology. And this also brings uh, to the fore the talent of the young Filipino researchers and uh, sequencing and the sacrifices they did during the time when it was ECQ and they had to be housed at the Philippine Genome Center to come up with the sequences. And it also brings to the fore the significance of collaborating with our clinicians and policymakers so that we can, and we can advance the science of genomics as well as, of course, infectious disease research in the Philippines. And for that, I'm very, very thankful to our collaborators from the National Institutes of Health and the Philippine General Hospital. And hopefully, as we try to sequence the entire Philippine samples, we will have more collaborators who will join our team. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Cynthia Saloma for an inspiring, extremely informative. And as always, Paul, you, you were able to uh, share po to let's say to our lay folks po how how all of these uh, really translate in terms of the need for understanding it in terms of policy and for uh, how it affects our practice po. Uh, at this point, uh, I will give the floor to Dr. Susie for uh, like uh, for an introduction po for our closing remarks speaker. Thank you very much, Raymond. So uh, we're delighted to have with us. Uh, we had her before and we have her again. And we're going to keep on having her on <laughs> this webinar. But, uh, you know, the National Institutes of Health at the University of the Philippines plays a big role in um, advancing our understanding of how we can scientifically address the pandemic. So uh, my honor, my pleasure to re-invite uh, Dr. Eva Maria Cutionco de La Paz, who is the Executive Director of uh, the National Institutes of Health and the Director of the Health Program of the Philippine Genome Center. Eva, please. You might be there you go. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mercado, for your kind introduction. Uh, if, if there's one word that would uh, summarize this webinar, it is national patrimony. Uh, magandang uh, tanghali po sa inyong lahat, lalo na po sa kay UP Professor Emeritus Gigi Alfonso, Dr. Susie Mercado, Dr. Raymond Sarmiento, AVP Professor Angelica Abad, and of course, TVUP and PhilHealth, uh, thank you for this opportunity to share as part of my closing remarks about our vision for genomic medicine in the Philippines. Genomic medicine is an exciting and maturing area of medicine that uses genetic information to guide individualized treatment. The National Institutes of Health, Philippine General and Philippine Genome Center are taking the lead on research capacity building and institutional linkages for the development of genome-based applications in our country. The precision medicine initiatives hope to achieve a better understanding on how a person's genetics, environment, and lifestyle can help determine the best approach 
to prevent or treat disease. During infectious disease outbreaks, Dr. Cynthia Salonas excellently discussed how whole genome sequencing can help us first to understand the transmission of the virus by examining the changes in the genetic sequence of the viral genomes collected from different patients. A viral family tree can be constructed. It is possible to actually monitor disease spread within and between populations over time and identify hotspots as well as super spreaders. So I like the idea of Dr. Mercado that she presented that we should actually target those areas were uh, identified as hotspots and quickly uh, sequenced those, uh, the, vi the uh, viruses from those areas, the virus from those coming from those areas. This information can be used to plan targeted public health interventions to reduce disease spread. Second, a better understanding of the viral DNA sequence will assist in designing therapies and vaccines that target specific features of the virus. Again, we heard that from Dr. Saloma. Third, continually tracking the virus will alert researchers to genetic changes that might give rise to less virulent or more virulent strains. Every warning of a more virulent virus or emergence of uh, treatment resistance will be vital to support measures to minimize disease spread. And lastly, and very important, is preparing for future pandemics. The experience that we gain now will be highly informative when responding to future outbreaks in the most efficient and effective manner possible. Through funding provided by the Department of Science and Technology, Philippine Council for Health Research and Development, gene genomic databases for heart disease and diabetes specific for the Filipino population are also being built to make the practice of medicine more precise and personal. This approach allows physicians to more accurately predict, accurately predict which treatment and prevention strategies will be most effective uh, for a particular disease, eliminating the trial and error approach to healthcare. With the data that we now have, we will be able to offer to a certain degree the right dr drug at the right dose for the right Filipino. And this is in line with the Saktong Lunas para sa Saktong Pinoy initiative of the Department of Science and Technology. A similar program for cancer care has been developed to make uh, genetic testing available, accessible, and affordable to every Filipino. We will be engaging the whole country, the whole nation, in the Filipino Genome Project, an initiative to sequence 7,000 641 Filipino genomes representing our different islands to create a national Filipino reference sequence as Filipinos are poorly represented in existing public genomic reference databases. So yan lang po uh, ang nais kong ipa, ipabahagi sa inyo ngayong hapon. Uh, kadugtong po ito ng um, genomic surveillance uh, uh, presentation ni Dr. Saloma na pinakita how important uh, sequencing is as, uh, and its applications to uh, having a, a be better health for Filipinos. Maraming salamat po muli sa inyong pakikilahok sa panayam na ito. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Eva of the NIH. Again, another patriotic moment. I don't know if I'm the only one who's becoming emotional. But, uh, you know, this is really good news to everybody that we are really moving towards greater self-sufficiency in medicine and public health. We're not waiting for people to tell us what to do, but based on um, our, our local talents and the hard work of so many people, so many scientists who we don't see, they're working behind the scenes. We are deriving new solutions. We're positive, we're constructive. And it's just a very, it's been an empowering webinar. So uh, I just want to thank everyone for being with us today. Special mention to uh, Isa Alejandria, who's with us. And next week, uh, please be with us again. We're going to have the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry of the Philippine General Hospital, Dr. Anselmo Tronco, who's known to many as Nonet, is going to talk to us about mental health, mindfulness, and COVID. And 
I think, uh, come up with uh, his own take on how it is that we are able to cope and cope well with a very, very challenging situation for everyone. So be with us again, again next Friday for our webinar at noontime. And we're going to tackle mental health, mindfulness, and COVID-19. Over to you, Raymond. Thank you so much. Uh, first and foremost, Paul, maraming salamat to my boss, uh, NIH Executive Director, uh, Dr. Eva Maria Cochongo de La Paz. And also thank you for those uh, parting words and reminders, Paul, from uh, Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado, who is, uh, like I mentioned, Special Envoy of the President for Global Health Initiatives. So mental health, po. Ang ating topic for next week, it is a topic po na talagang pinupush po na magkaroon po po tayo ng mas maraming researches by our Department of Science and Technology Secretary, uh, Dr. Fortunato de la Peña. So a lot of these things have been cropping up, not just because of the efforts by our scientists, but also because of the fact that COVID-19 has brought about a lot of anxiety and mental health problems because of the ano po. Uh, the lockdown and the uncertainty of the future po. So as always, uh, inaanyayahan po namin po kayong lahat na samahan po kami every Friday, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Uh, make this our Friday habit for the UP uh, Feel Health uh, Stop COVID Deaths webinar series. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you online.